Welcome back to my PyTorch tutorial series. Today we're going to go through a series of examples that lead us into constructing a full sequential neural network. The goal of this video is going to be to design a function that's simple in architecture but can still take in arbitrary independent data and fit it to arbitrary dependent data. This will be done using a sequence of simple linear transformations, probably the simplest mathematical operation, followed by a slight non-linearity added each time. This is the beauty of machine learning. These neural networks are actually very simple in their architecture, but they're able to make powerful and general predictions from a data set. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoy the series. Join the Discord server as well. There's a link to that in the description and enjoy. So we're importing today torch. We have the torch.neural network module. Uh, like in the previous tutorial, we also have this stochastic gradient descent SGD optimizer. And then for a few other miscellaneous tasks, we also have numpy and matplotlib. So let's just go over a quick summary of what exactly machine learning is. This is the foundation for everything that we're going to be doing in this tutorial series. And so basically you have a set of data consisting of an independent vector and a dependent vector. The independent vector is xi and the dependent vector is yi. So for example, xi could be the height of the ith person and yi is their weight. You have a number of people, different heights, different weights. Uh, and you can plot those on a plot. Uh, you can have xi as the picture of the handwritten digit, for example, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's an actual image. And then yi is the digit label itself, so the actual number. Uh, xi could be a CT scan of a patient and yi is another image. So each yi is a separate image. And they're the corresponding pixels that correspond to tumors. So it's like a mask. You have zeros and then ones wherever there's a tumor. That's actually my research that I do. The idea is that the yi's can be predicted from the xi's. So for with the handwritten digit example, you have a picture of a digit. You should There's some knowledge about that picture that tells you what digit that is. If I see a picture of a nine, my brain, my neural network of my brain can translate that into, yes, that's the number nine. So you want to predict the yi's from the xi's. So that's exactly the goal of a neural network. Um, in a neural network, you define a function f. It's a complicated function. It has some parameters a that you can adjust so that the function is slightly different. And it makes predictions, which I call yi hat. So yi hat should be as close to yi as possible. You feed in the input data. So this is like your brain doing the work. F of xi, um, semicolon a, is like I'm feeding in the image. I'm looking at an image in my brain. I'm processing it and then I get a yi hat, a prediction. So if I'm looking at a picture of a digit, I look at this picture, it's, you know, pixels and whatever, and I can predict what number that is based on the information contained. So the idea then is that you want to make the predictions yi hat and yi, the true values as close as possible by modifying the values of a. And so when you're predicting height and weight, that's pretty easy. The, the, uh, yi hat and yi are as close as possible when the numbers of those two things are as close as possible. You, the predicted weight is close numerically to the actual weight of the person. But of course, when you're dealing with images and digits, for example, like how close is a nine to an eight when you're predicting digits? Like, yeah, they're numbers, you could subtract them, but is a nine and an eight really much different than a nine and a two, right? It's like more discrete values. And so that similarity becomes a little more complicated to define. And in general, you would define a similarity function or in machine learning, you call this a loss function, L of Y and Y I hat. And the smaller that that function is, L Y Y hat, the closer that those predictions are. So a really easy loss function is L of Y Y hat. Well, you sum together like Y I minus Y I hat. This would work for, for example, predicting weights. You sum them all together, you take the difference, the difference of the sum of the squares, and that tells you how close your predictions are to the true values. And of course, when you're dealing with like handwritten digits or CT scans and um, corresponding tumor masks, zeros and ones, where the output is an actual image itself, uh, this of course becomes slightly more complicated. You have to be a little more clever about how you define your loss function. So in the last video, I had four data points. So I was from one, two, three, four, and I had X, I, Y, I. And I wanted to find a function F such that F of X, I equals Y, I for every single one of those data points. Um, each xi was a vector of length two, and so I chose the function f of x is, well, I have a, a matrix times x, a1, x, and then multiply by another matrix. And uh, a1 is an eight by two matrix, so this converts a vector of length two, 
you multiply that by an 8 by 2 matrix, it becomes a vector of length 8. Uh, and then A2 is a 1 by 8 matrix, so it takes that this A1x is a vector of length 8, and I multiply this by a 1 by 8 mat uh, matrix, and I get just a single number. So there are 16 plus 8 free parameters. But it didn't do a very good job of making f of xi equal to yi. So this code here is just from the previous video. My four data points for x are 6, 2, 5, 2, 1, 3, and 7, 6. These are like uh, four independent data points. And my um, independent variable y, the corresponding values were 1 that corresponded to 6, 2, 5 that corresponded to 5, 2, and 2 that corresponded to 1, 3, and 5 that corresponded to 7, 6. So these are my independent data and my dependent data. And so in the previous video, of course, you've watched, I defined a neural network. Um, I went over that in the previous video. Uh, I created an instance of the neural network. I created an optimizer, which took in the parameters of this neural network and a corresponding learning rate. This optimizer will, is used to tune the parameters of F. And then I defined a loss function as the mean squared error loss. And I just trained this model. I, I did it 50 times. So it went over the data set 50 times, tuning the parameters each time using stochastic gradient descent. Again, something I went over in the previous video. Um, uh, and the training procedure is essentially just like this. I take the loss function. Uh, I use backpropagation to compute the gradient. And I use this gradient of the loss function to tune the net, uh, parameters of my network. And I can append the losses. And of course, I need to import my packages. And if I run this, so I have my data, um, I'm training my model. Uh, this is what I want. The, uh, these are my true data points, my true independent variable, and my function, which takes in x, which of course is just this. So it takes in 6, 2, 5, 2, 1, 3, and 7, 6, and it should predict something as close to y as possible. And you can see that it's not very close. So it turns out that the previous model really wasn't very good at all. Although there were 24 parameters in the model, we had a 2 by 8 matrix and a 1 by 8 matrix in two matrices, there was actually only two independent parameters, and I'll explain. That's because A2 times A1, which of course shows up in this matrix transform, there's two matrices. If you multiply them together, you actually get a single matrix B. And B is a two by one matrix. So our function was really F of X equals BX, where B is just a two by one matrix. So there's really effectively only two free parameters. So we have to change things so that we can maintain 24 free parameters from those two matrices. So then the question becomes, well, I want to use matrices multiplied by vector because linear algebra is a very simple way of computing transforms of data. So I want the simplicity of linear algebra, but I really want to build up advanced models. I don't want like the matrices to collapse like this into two by one matrices. I want to have this ease of multiplying vectors by matrices, but not have these matrices collapse into single matrix. So that's like the big thing of machine learning. And you define something, a very special thing, called an activation function. And these activation functions add ever so slight non-linearities to a sequence of matrix transforms. So I'll explain what I mean. Our old model was f of x equals a2 times a1 times x. And this is essentially just a single matrix. a2 times a1 is effectively just one matrix times x. But then with this activation function, you consider again this new model, f2 of x. So it's a new model. It's a2 times r, where r is an activation function times a1 of x. And R is an element-wise operator, meaning R operates separately on every element of the vector. And R is the very simple function. R of X is equal to X if X is greater than zero, or zero if X is less than or equal to zero. So R of X sort of looks like this. It's zero, and then it's just equal to itself if it's greater than zero. So it's something that anytime you get a negative value, it's equal to zero, and every time you get a positive value, it's just equal to that value itself. So, you know, it's li linear, for positive numbers, but because you have positive and negative numbers, uh, the nonlinearity lies in the fact that it's not just equal to x, it's equal to zero for negative numbers. And it's very, very close to being a linear operator, right? Because a linear operator would just be r of x equals x. That's a linear operator. It's very close, but it's not quite because it has this nonlinearity for negative values. So let's actually look at this. So here I have um, x, I have basically just uh, this would be like one vector and another vector. You can think of this as like data points. This is my first data point, 4, 6, 2, negative 1, 6, 2, 5. And my second data point is this. And if I use the ReLU activation function on this vector x, of course, the vector it consists of two data points, what it will do is it will set all the negative values equal to zero. So here I have r as the ReLU function. 
And if I operate R on X, it sets all the places where there are negative values equal to zero. So this is a non-linear operator that I'm operating on these vectors. Uh, here's another example. X is just a bunch of values between negative three and three, and Y is equal to R of X. And if I plot the ReLU function, you can see that all the values that are less than zero get set equal to zero. All the values that are greater than zero are equal to this. And of course, if I just plot um, y equals x, which is very close, I get this, which is just the identity function, which is linear, and the ReLU function uh, just sets them equal to zero. So it's a very slight nonlinearity applied to the vector. So the question is, how much better does our model do when we make this simple adjustment? Well, here's my new neural network. I define the matrices like I did before. The only difference between this model and the old model is I now have the ReLU function, which I call self.r. So r stands for the activation function. I'm setting that equal to the ReLU function. And the only change I make is I'm using the ReLU function after I do this matrix transform. So this matrix transform gives you a vector of a new length, right? And then the ReLU function sets all the values that are e uh, less than zero equal to zero. So I have my non-linearity going on here. Then I do the second matrix transform like I did before. So I'm basically just doing this and I'm adding in this R and then I output it like I did in the previous video and I can train the model. Uh, again, I'm doing it exactly the same as I did above. I just write a function here that automates it. So I pass in my X and Y data. I pass in my neural network and the number of epochs I want to train for. This is just a function that basically um, consolidates all the code that I wrote above. Uh, my optimizer, my loss function, and then I train for a bit. Um, so here I define my X and Y data like I did above. Uh, my new neural network, which is the one that has the activation function, I can train it for a little bit and now I can look at the predictions. And you see that it's still not close, but it turns out that it actually is better than it is above. These are slightly closer. 4.9 is kind of close to 5. 1.34 is kind of close to 2. You know, they're getting closer, but they're still not great. So it's time to add some more features to our network. We're sort of building up what exactly a neural network is. The real advantage of this slight nonlinearity that we add to the matrix transform is that we can make our matrices larger. So now rather than having a one by eight and a two by eight matrix, we're gonna make them 80 by two and one by 80. And the reason we can add all these extra parameters is because of our nonlinear activation function. Remember that without the activation function, we would just have A2, A1 equals B. So even though this is 80 by two and one by 80, they would condense into a two by one matrix. We'd only have effectively two parameters. So now that I have these activation functions that introduce these nonlinearities, I can keep all 240 parameters of these two matrices. So now our old model was uh, F2 of X is A2 R A1 of X, where A2 is one by eight and A1 is eight by two. That was the model that we just trained above. Now we're going to make A2 and A1 have more parameters. So now it's uh, 80 by two and one by 80. That's our new model. So the only thing we change is eight to 80 here. And I make my new neural network. Uh, I get an instance of my new neural network and I train my new neural network. So I can train it pretty quick. And I get F3 and I should compare this to Y. And you can see that it is getting closer, right? More parameters, the model's getting a little bit closer. Uh, 1.88 to one, 3.7, you know, it's still not great, but it's certainly getting closer. So we can make our model even better by introducing other parameters. So of course, a general matrix transform is A, X plus B. A is a matrix, X is the vector you're transforming, and B is the bias vector. You've probably seen that in linear algebra courses you've made. So now we're gonna make a new model, F of X, where I'm gonna add bias vectors. So B1 is the bias vector corresponding to A1. So B1 and A1 have a similar shape. Of course, B1 is a vector, A1 is a matrix, but they're matching. And then B2 and A2, of course, have that uh, similar property as well, right? If A2, for example, is uh, one by 80, then B2 is just a single parameter. And if A1 is 80 by two, then B1 is going to have length of 80 as the bias vector. So now our old model uh, was just F3 equals A2 R A1 X, where I made the matrices larger in size, but now I'm introducing these bias vectors, which as you'll see, really help to make the model make better predictions. So I'm updating my model now to have an even more complicated neural network. So I have my new model. The only thing I change is above, I was setting bias equal to false. So there was not the bias vectors. By default, it gives you a bias vector. So now we have the bias vectors uh, in these, even though it's called matrices, these are really linear transforms that have a matrix plus a bias vector. And so I make my new model. 
I define my data like before, a new instance of my neural network, and I train it using that function. And I can look at the predictions of my network, and really, now they're starting to get quite a bit closer to Y, but still not quite. So 1.48, uh, closer to 1, it's better than above. Uh, 4.37 to 5, 2.01 to 2, that's pretty close, and 5.03 to 5 is pretty close. So it's getting close to those numbers, but it's still not exact. So now is really where you can see the power of the neural network. We're going to make one final adjustment that will make the prediction very good. What we're going to do is we're going to add another matrix in the middle. So our old model, F4, which we just trained above, was A2, R of A1, X, B1 plus B2. So we do one uh, matrix transform, then we activation function it, then we do another matrix transform. Now we're going to add another matrix, and you can see that we're doing like one transform, then another, then another. So first we transform X like this, A1, X plus B1. Then we do the activation function R on it. Then we do A2 times this new vector plus B2. Then we do another activation function. And then finally we have the final matrix. So A3 is 1 by 80. This gets you to, well, there's one Y or vector of length 1, right? So you predict a single value for this network because Y is just like 1, 5, 2, 5. Uh, A2, the center matrix, I'm now going to have an 80 by 80 matrix. So now I have lots of parameters in this function. Uh, A1 is 80 by 2. Well, the uh, independent vector X that comes in, the vector is length 2. So this 80 by 2 turns this vector of length 2 into a vector of length 80. This uh, matrix A2, it turns it from a vector of length 80 to a vector of length 80. And then finally, it turns A3 turns it from a vector of length 80 to a vector of length 1, which matches the output size of Y here. So now we have quite a few more parameters. We've introduced quite a few more parameters in these linear transforms. The only reason we could do that and have them be independent free parameters is that we have these nonlinear activation functions R here. So here I define my new network. The only thing I'm doing different is I now have three matrices. So now I have an 80 by 80 uh, transform in the middle. And then in my uh, function where I actually call the network, I do matrix one, uh, then activation function it. Uh, matrix 2, activation function this, and then finally matrix 3. Um, and so I define my uh, data like I did before. An instance of my neural network, initially all the parameters are randomized. Uh, I train the model for 5,000 epochs. And finally I look at y, 1, 5, 2, 5, and my prediction, and it is extremely close to the values. So it's predicting y from x almost exactly, and it's doing it technically by overfitting, and we'll get into that in future videos. But the message here, the most important message out of this video, is that we've designed a model that's general enough that it can take this sort of random input X and it can use this complicated model structure that F, the neural network, is powerful enough that it can take that and transform it into the output data that you want. So it has the potential to fit these arbitrary data points. Yes, it's overfitting, and yes, that's something that we're going to try to stop in the future, but the point is that F is versatile enough that it can fit this somewhat arbitrary data set. That sort of leads me into the conclusion of this video, and that's what the sequential neural network is. That's what we've designed in this video. And it's sort of written like this. I have this uh, kappa thing. Maybe you haven't seen this before. I didn't quite know what symbol to use. But you can see that what's going on here is that I have AI times X plus BI, and then activation function RI here. So. This is like your matrix transform on your vector, and then you have your activation function. And this sum of kappa thing here just means that uh, it's defined such that if you have kappa i equals 1 to n of fi of x, it's fn, it's like a function of a function of a function of a function. So you take f1 of x, you plug that into f2, so then you get f2 of f1 of x. Then f3, you plug in f3 of f2 of f1 of x, and it sort of goes like a chain. So you're taking functions of functions of functions of functions. And of course, that's sort of what you see uh, here above. You do this, then you take this uh, activation function, then you plug that into the second function, uh, then the activation function, then you plug that into the third function, and you can sort of see how it works here. So that's sort of the sequential neural network, is you do one thing, then you take the output of that, plug it into another thing that is a similar structure, and you do that over and over again. Uh, and typically, the last layer, the ri, is just the identity function. So there is no activation function in the final uh, like FN here, for example. Uh, the next video, we'll look at training on some real data. So be sure to subscribe, like, and I'll see you next time.